Sally. I've been calling every motel within 20 miles of Monument Valley trying to find you. You, you were supposed to call me as soon as you got there. I, I just arrived, babe. <laughs> the bus was late. And then my rental car broke down north of Flagstaff. Oh, man, that's awful. Uh, it wasn't that bad. You'll never guess who stopped to help me out. Two guys in a pickup truck. A cowboy and an Indian. Mom, you're joking, right? <laughs> no, I'm not. They couldn't have been nicer. Well, anyway, I'm finally here with the Desert Motor Inn. Color TV, telephone, best rates, vacancy. Says so right on the sign. There's a door in my room that I guess leads to the adjacent room. <laughs> it's that kind of place. Ah, uh, sounds like a dive. You could say that. Anyway, I'm here now, so... Rainy, dark, I am beat. Hopefully tomorrow it'll clear up. Mike, the craziest thing happened a little while ago. As I was getting close to the Utah State Line, that song came on the radio. The one that always makes me cry. Of course I turned the dial since I could hardly be sobbing my eyes out while driving on strange roads in the middle of the night and pouring down rain. But there was only one other station on the air and they were playing the same song. Strange, no? Anyway, I'm here now so you can quit worrying. Mike? Huh? Yeah? I know you don't understand what I'm doing half the time. I mean, why I just traveled 2,000 miles to a cheap motel in the middle of nowhere. But you grew up with a mother and a father. You had a childhood, a continuous tracking shot on which to build a life. What did I have in this place? Fragmented memories and disassociated emotions, fear of heights, visions of Monument Valley, a song that makes me cry, and a picture in my mind of a handsome man in an elegant suit who may or may not be my father, but probably is. The scent of his cologne. <coughs> How is it possible that I can recall the exact fragrance of his cologne and not even know who he is? Oh, uh, you're always going to be searching for them, aren't you? Your parents. You're always going to wish you could find them. You have a past, Mike. I have a, a riddle. Maybe that's why I write. Maybe that's why my language is so jagged. Because one day, long ago, I was broken. Like Humpty Dumpty. And I'm still trying to connect the pieces of my story. I mean, if I were granted one wish, yeah, that would be it, to find my parents. I mean, I'd like to understand how I came to be marooned in life with no name, no past, and a head injury. Well, it's obvious, Sally. Your, your parents beat you, and, and then they abandoned you. Or maybe you were rescued, that's how. Dinner dance in the room next door. Oh my god, the door's opening. What the hell? You need to get out of there, Sal. What? It's a it's a ballroom, right? With portholes. Must be an ocean liner. There's an orchestra. And a room full of people. They all look as if they stepped out of the 1930s. What?
No. You're an American, are you? On your way back home? Um, if you say so. Yeah, you speak German quite well, in fact. German? Up until this moment, I didn't even realize I spoke German. That's one of the most remarkable things I've heard in a while. You must have lived in Germany in a past life. I suppose that's possible. Speaking of which, uh, I seem to have lost all track of time tonight. What year is it? I beg your pardon. I'm wondering if you can tell me the year. The last time I checked, it was 1937. But I'm still trying to place you. As am I. You're uh, traveling alone, I see. Well, I had a wife and daughter once, but we uh, parted ways, apparently. Sorry to hear that. Oh, well, there's something to be said about traveling light. Still can't place you, I'm afraid. My name is Sally. Sally? Oh, my. Sorry, still not ringing any bells. No, I suppose it wouldn't. Because that's the name they gave me at the orphanage. Would you like me to give you a couple more hints? Rather like the middle of rumble stiltskin, is that it? Um, why not? Here, take a look. Apparently I sustained a skull fracture in early childhood. Oh, and perhaps you'd like to see the scars on my arms from burns, they tell me? Is that ringing any bells for you? You're quite serious, aren't you? I couldn't be more serious. And look here, are you traveling with anyone? No. Why do you ask? You seem a bit unsettled, perhaps ill. May I summon a doctor for no, you? No, you may not. I would like to try and figure out what's going on, so if you could perhaps start by telling me exactly how you came about this. Mr. Jackson, Daddy! Oh, did you now, sweetheart? <laughs> oh, it took so long, darling. The captain stopped to chat with us in the passageway. We had a very nice conversation. Did you hear Rebecca? Oh, yes, a very nice conversation. He invited me to the on our return on our return trip across the ocean. Oh, and what did you tell him? I told him I didn't know what the what that would be that would be delighted to do so after our holiday in America. <laughs> Is everything already? Oh yes, quite all right. This American traveler and I were just getting acquainted. It's Sally, correct? Yes, uh, Mrs. Sally Wilcox. Well, if I may introduce you to my wife. How do you do? I'm Laura. Laura Rosenstein. Anyway, dear, the captain used to live in the United States, and he's been everywhere. He says that one place we must see, should we have a chance, is Monument Valley, out of the American West. Apparently, the wind and rain have, with the passage of time, have unforgettably beautiful images into the sandstone and shale. Have you been there, Mrs. Wilcox? <laughs> Once. Yes, a long time from now. Will you take Spotter and perhaps we can see the Cowboys and Indians as well? <laughs> oh, that's the real reason you'd like to go, isn't it? To see the Cowboys and Indians? Oh, yes, it is. Oh, then we shall go there one day. That's my promise. Listen, I am truly sorry for my tone a moment ago. That's quite all right. No apology necessary. It's probably the altitude. Altitude. Don't give it another thought. Everyone seems to be looking out of the windows here. Oh, well, let's go see what all the fuss is about, shall we? Coastline. Lights. Oh, look, Rebecca, down below. The coast of North America. Then we'll be arriving soon? Tomorrow, darling, just as the captain said. We are heading now to the coast of New England, and we'll be arriving tomorrow at a place called New Jersey. New ship Zeppelin. Hindenburg. <laughs> oh, there's that song that's been all the rage. What do you say we dance? The three of us? Not likely. And why not? Will you please excuse us? Wait! Hold on! There's something very important you need to know. That you all need to know. Can't you hear me anymore? Can you see me? I always knew you loved me 
Father. Mother. I always knew you'd find a way to prove it to me. I never gave up hope. Whatever happened to that woman, Mrs. Walker? That's odd. She seems to have vanished in the thin air. She seemed a bit unhinged. I do hope she'll be all right. I never ever gave up hope! been trying to reach you for half an hour. Would you mind telling me what's going on out there? Are, are you okay? Yes, Mike, I'm okay. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Oh. I'm still here. Room 217 of the Desert Motor Inn. Color TV, telephone, best traits, vacancy. And I'm fine. What about uh, disturbance in the next room? It's quieted down. Can I call you back later? <laughs> or, or better yet, I will tell you everything as soon as I get home. When's that gonna be? Soon. I just, I wanna have a look around for a day or two and then I'll, I'll drop the car off in Flagstaff and then I'll take the bus home. Or who knows, maybe I'll fly. You fly? <laughs> maybe, I said. No promises. Whatever you say, is, as long as you're all right. Mike. What is it? I just opened the curtains for the first time. It stopped raining and the sun's beginning to rise. So, what do you see out there? I see everything. The mittens, Elephant Butte, the, the totem pole, maybe? I think that's what they call it. It's like a dream, Mike. I, I have been waiting to visit Monument Valley my entire life, and I am finally here. It's just like a movie. A western, in fact. And it's beautiful. More beautiful than I could have ever imagined. Donnie. 
make them notice you or they forget. You get old and you disappear. You live here sitting in the shadows. <laughs> we have got to be the squeaky wheel, Donnie. <laughs> <laughs> it's just you and me, kid. Shoot me. 
Macho, macho man. I'm gonna be a macho man. Well, how about some cocoa, dude? I'll go get you some. He gone? Good. Let's work on our new routine. We can make it to the bit where we go. Shall I come back later this evening and see if you need anything, Miss Donnelly? That'll be all, Mark. We'll call if we need anything. How about we open the act for the new song? I've got a great one to use as my signature tune. <laughs> Penny, listen to me, Diddy. It's hard to settle down. Am I asking too much for you to stick around? Every boy wants a girl he can trust to the very end. Baby, that's you. Won't you wait? But tell them. When I see lips waiting to be kissed, stop. I can't stop, stop. I can't stop. Lightning striking again. Lightning strike. That is enough. <laughs> How do I look, Toots? <laughs> well, you uh, look fine, but that song is such sexist crap. Hold on. I know. Great, isn't it? Yeah, well, it sounds like we hate women. What do you mean, we? <laughs> Thank you. 
Our fans are waiting. Ready, Freddy? Yep. Hey, Doogie, we gotta get better help. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Doogie! Uh, yeah? I got a new girlfriend. A blonde. Really? That's nice, Donnie. Yeah, she taught me all sorts of new stuff. <laughs> Easy now, Donnie. We have some little old ladies in the audience. <laughs> Donnie, do you know how to keep a blonde busy all day? No. How? Write the word flip on both sides of a piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> and I learned how to keep a blonde naked and in the shower for hours. What? Give her a bottle of shampoo that says lab the rich and repeat, ha! <laughs> yes, which I call a blonde with a brain. I think I am a golden retriever, ha! <laughs> <laughs> okay, Donnie, Donnie, that is enough. I'm sure we have some blondes in the audience. It is time to change the subject, Donnie. <laughs> hey, do I got a new job a couple of months ago. Really? Doing what? Used car salesman. Oh, geez, Donnie. There's got to be easier jobs than that. Yeah, tell me about it. The other day, I was trying to sell this Buick to the sexy punk brunette. <laughs> but I was pleading with her. I says, hey, lady, if I don't sell more cars this month, I am gonna lose my frickin' ass. So this broad says, well, if I don't sell my ass this month, I won't be able to buy your freaking car. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Hello. Come in. I'm Marvin Treat, LPN. I, I take care of doors here at Variety Home. I'm Grace Bennett, the RN hired to monitor Miss Donnelly for the next few days. What's the doc say? He's ruled out heart attack. We think she's had a TIA. These small strokes don't do too much damage individually, but there's cumulative damage if she's had more than one. Well, I don't think she's had others. It's hard to tell, though. That hormone combo she was on had a strong testosterone component. Combine that with the dementia drugs, I'm surprised she isn't worse than she is. We'll be weaning her off those meds. But. No more performing. She needs less Well, excitement. the stroke didn't kill her. Not performing will. She was a major headliner, and these little shows are all she's got left. I'm afraid that's going to have to change. She had no emergency contact in her records. Did she mention anyone to you? Any idea how to reach her next of kin? This is him. Doris has no family other than us here at Variety Home and this little devil. <clears throat> She's comfortable for the moment. I gave her a sedative. She'll be out for a while. Go get yourself some coffee.
Boy, you sure gave them some show, Doris Donnelly. Everybody thought it was part of the act. Scared the hell out of me. Damn it, Judy, I thought I had lost you. They're gonna fix your meds. Don't you worry. I'll make sure of it. But the doc says you gotta ease up on the performing. Time for you and the kid to retire, dude. Hey, Bob. What's worse than a male showing his pig? An old woman who won't do what she's told. <laughs> <laughs> Jack walks up with nothing left to lose. 
Jack walks up these stairs to the whiskey bar. Music is playing. Unfamiliar music he can't begin to understand. He is seated next to a woman he can't begin to decipher. Is there is something familiar about her. Yet he knows he has never met her before. Perhaps there is a faint stirring of attraction. It does not matter. She belongs to another. Let me ask you something. How many matches are left in the matchbook? Three. Four. Lucky strike. Now there are three. <laughs> What are you doing working in this dive? Maybe you should team up with a dog act and a ventriloquist and go on the road. I have been on the road. I have no use for the road. As for you, Jack the Builder, I'm sorry your life has come to this. Maybe one day it will be better. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what really bothers me? You always think you're going to be something special. When you're young, I mean. Do something of importance, make your mark somehow, or at least have a family. Sometimes the story just ends, lives simply fail. At least that seems to be what happened in my case. This doll was an incredible mind reader and a pretty good storyteller to boot. I went back, once, twice, a round of stories for a round of drinks. That was the basic calculus. There was something ineffably and undeniably alluring about her. I will tell you another story. A man dreams of Buenos Aires. Day and night he dreams of her. Afternoons at the Café Tortoni. Up a flight of stairs, somewhere within the faded grandeur of the Recolita. A room with a bed. She told her tales as if they were seductions, incantations, opening doors inside me that had long been shut. I found myself dreaming deeply again thinking of second chances. The waiter, I began to call Pierre, continued to provide a certain cosmopolitan atmosphere. <laughs> On the bed, a beautiful woman who once gave him pleasure beyond imagining. When he was with her, he forgot his insignificance. His heart has been kidnapped, trapped inside the memory of those streets, of that room, that bed. That's very evocative. It sounds almost realistic. Realistic, you say? That story belonged to an old man with roomy eyes and a threadbare coat at a town fair in the south of Brazil. You haven't told me your name yet. Princess Doraldina. <laughs> Princess Doraldina. You don't run into that name every day. Where are you from? I was brought up amongst the scent of rosewood and mahogany and gun oil. And then I traveled past the outskirts of a hundred ragged cities on ox carts and steamships and trains. And now I am here. How long have you been here? For many years. How about another story? The Great War. The war that was to end all wars. A soldier <coughs> marches past the smoldering ruins of Budapest. He sees the face of a girl in a shop window. A face he has seen before. For this is the face of a girl on a postage stub. A stump he keeps in a glassine envelope 
Inside the pages of his childhood stamp album. The first girl he ever loved. He marches on with his unit. An unbearable weight in his chest, for he knows he will never see her again. What happens after that? The soldier is badly injured in the war. Today he hobbles around in his dusty pawn shop on the outskirts of Prague. He, he thinks of her still. You've got a fervent imagination. Maybe you should write a book. I did not imagine these stories. These stories are all around us. Every day, everywhere we look. It was my fate to hear them. I am hoping that by telling them one by one, I can begin to let them go, to forget. There is not enough room in my chest to contain them all. Just what country are you princess of anyway? No single country, but many countries. I am princess of the Midway, of the Carnival, of the Penny Arcade. I'm not sure I follow you. I was created by the Ruver Brothers Novelty Company of Philadelphia. They manufactured and named me and sent me out into the world. Princess Doraldina, the fortune teller. For more than a century, I traveled the world in my glass and mahogany home and watched as an endless, sad parade of solitary souls stood in front of my fortune-telling machine to try to untangle the riddle of their lives. Their fortunes I could not predict. That task belonged to the gears inside the machine. But I soon found that I could hear their thoughts through the glass, just as clearly as I can hear your voice. As each stood, waiting for his Pointed fate to unwind from the spool inside the machine. They could see the pity in my eyes, even through the smudged and dusty glass. They could see that I was listening, and they grew still. And in that moment, they confessed their every secret, unburdened the inchoate longings and desires of a lifetime. The town drunk remembered his long abandoned dreams of greatness. The righteous citizens, their long hidden crimes. There is not enough space in all the world to contain all these stories and all these secrets. I'm trying to decide just how crazy you are. <laughs> of course I am crazy. Crazy with pathos. Mad with tenderness. Who would not go crazy after listening to all these secret thoughts of a great and terrible century on earth? told me that you belong to another. I don't suppose you tell me who your boyfriend is. His name is Zoltar. <laughs> Zoltar. <laughs> Zoltar, the magnificent. <laughs> Sitting across from one another in our glass and wood cocoons, a princess and her emperor. We could read each other's minds flawlessly, effortlessly. Our love affair was one of the great romances of the century. There will never be another like it. Where's this character now? This character? He perished right in front of my eyes. One winter day, a fire spread across our great arcade. I awaited my fate with perfect equanimity, for I would to lose my existence, Zoltar and I would still be together. Then, a sudden shattering of glass, and I was being pulled to safety by this man whom you call Pierre. Perhaps that is his real name. I'll never know. Zoltar was gone, lost to this, the physical plane. I followed my rescuer through the city streets and then end up the stairs to Le Whiskey Bar.
The story she was peddling was becoming more outlandish by the moment. How does one even respond to such a load of malarkey? I didn't know what her hustle was. I went back. Now listen here, princess. I'm a builder, or at least I was. I believe in things that are real, things you can see, realistic things. I don't subscribe to black magic or shape-shifting or mind-reading mannequins. You're a fabulous is what you are, spinning fantasies out of thin air. A mesmerist. A failed novelist, maybe. But whoever you are, I've decided that I can live with you. Because the fact is, I, I've fallen in love with you. How do I know? Because I can't get you out of my head. For the first time in a very long time, I'm hopeful again about life's possibilities. What I'm trying to say is I, I want to spend the rest of my life with you. I, I'm no mind reader, but I can tell that you're in serious need of a change of scenery as well. How do I know you're not going to decide to put me inside a fortune telling machine? Mm -hmm. Why would I do that? You've already told me you're a terrible fortune teller. I've laid my cards on the table. What do you say? You must leave now. The whiskey bar is closing. Maybe. You need a few more years to think about it, is that it? Hoping that Zorro, or whatever his name is, will materialize out of the ether and carry you away? Or that some other dope like me will come across a book of matches in a jacket that doesn't belong to him and wind his way up those stairs and fall for your delusions and dissemblings? The whiskey bar is closing. It is time for you to go. I heard you the first time. Maybe I'll see you around. I walked out of there and I resolved to put this whole crazy chapter behind me. She'd made up her mind and there wasn't a lot I could do about it. One day, months later, I found myself at a cheap penny arcade on the waterfront. I watched as a fairly depressing slice of humanity sauntered by. Tourists in polyester slacks, low-rent families with fidgety kids, guys who hadn't quite hit rock bottom yet, who were maybe hoping for a momentary turnaround. There were two fortune-telling booths there. Not surprisingly, one of them was out of order. Unaccountably, there was a short line in front of the other. Esmeralda, said the sign over the glass. The William Ghent Company of New York, New York was the manufacturer. I stood in line and watched the losers in front of me insert their coins and extract their so-called fortunes on grubby slips of paper. When it was my turn, I scanned the mannequin's eyes for the faintest sign of life. And of course, detected none. I put my coin into the slot anyway, thinking that at the very least, Lady Karma could have a sardonic laugh at my expense. As my fortune emerged, a cold shudder went up my spine. Dear Jack, I need to see you again. Please hurry. Dorodina. I raced back to the building. The windows on the ground floor were boarded up. A, a sign on the wall said the building was about to be demolished. The, the door was locked. 
I broke the glass, turned the doorknob, and made my way up to the second floor. How did you do this? This message has been on this pool inside the machine since, since long before we met. A spool of 10,000 messages. It was there before you were born. Zoltar appeared to me last night, and I told him everything about how, after the fire, I began to picture a certain type of man, a man who could teach me about weights and measures and the laws of gravity, love on the physical plane. Jack the Builder, I called him, and how he appeared as if on cue, and how, because I was still torn in two, he walked away. And of course I told him about the aftermath. Which was? This feeling of unfathomable emptiness and fear, fear of being forever marooned, alone, in this strangely familiar, yet alien world. What did Zoltar have to say? Zoltar, although heartbroken, was infinitely kind. He said that my confusion was a sign that I am quickly becoming mortal, and that I must choose that if I were to choose to be with this man, he would understand. And so I have decided. I am ready, Jack. Ready to join the sad parade by your side. That is, if you still want to spend your life with me. Tell me. I can no longer hear your thoughts, Jack. Only my own. Those people out on the street, I can no longer hear what they are thinking. Even tonight, as they stared up at me with their curious, prying eyes, a, a temptress standing by an open window, their thoughts were as opaque to me as as a newspaper swirling around in the stairwell by the sidewalk. All of the memories of a century are quickly disappearing from my mind. A new disturbance is now pushing everything else away. What kind of disturbance is that? This one. This insistent oceanic disturbance. Will I ever get used to it, Jack? After a while, you won't notice it anymore. My transformation is almost complete. I am afraid I am damaged. Difficult. But full of improbable hope. Join the human race. Where's... Pierre, by the way, the merry Parisian. Oh, dear sweet Pierre. He went out for a loaf of bread one morning and never returned. It's a mystery. Maybe you and I should walk out here together and never return. Will I need a new name? You're going to need a lot of things. Jacket, for one. It's snowing out. 